Hey there, YouTube family. Welcome back to another hour-long painting lesson. Today, we're going to be painting these blue butterflies in the moonlight. And we're actually going to be doing so because it was voted for over on the Alpine level of Patreon. And it's, um, it's kind of a funny story. So a couple weeks ago, I put up a poll essentially asking everybody what lesson they wanted to see me paint next. And the winner was the Golden Gate Bridge. So I did the drawing, I did the painting, we put it out, and I'm actually really happy with that one. But over the last week, I, I didn't take the poll down, and the blue butterfly option actually surpassed the Golden Gate Bridge. So I said, okay, you know what? This will be the next one we work on for sure. So thank you to everyone who voted initially and everyone who is continuing to vote. It's really nice to have that second opinion. I will be putting up a new poll in the next week or two with a new set of paintings. That way you get to kind of decide what we do with this series. But with that said, here today we are painting these blue butterflies. Here I have a 9 by 12 inch canvas. I have the drawing already done and it was done with two mediums. These woodless colored pencils. I like these because A, they're erasable so I can kind of fix things up as I see fit in the drawing process. And then I have this fine tip sharpie that I went over everything with. And I like this because it shows through my first couple layers of paint. So if I'm kind of messy in the background and I kind of cover my butterfly, I can still see that drawing through that first layer of paint. So I don't have to stop, redraw everything, and then go back to the painting. I can just keep painting. So that's essentially what I'm using for the drawing. If you're looking at this and you're saying, that's that's a little bit daunting, Ryan. There's a lot of detail, a lot of different butterflies in different orientations and positions. Don't you worry about it. I did put up the digital sketch, which is essentially a traceable up over on Patreon along with the reference photo, just to make sure that you have the drawing just right, all of the proportioning, all of that just as good as can possibly be before you go into that painting process. And if you are new to the channel and unaware, Patreon is a great way to support the channel to say thank you, but it's also a great way to get a bunch of bonus rewards and perks. Up there you can get things like the reference photos, the digital sketches. At the Alpine level you can get access to things like the polls that we talked about, the exclusive Facebook page where we all kind of post our work and help each other, give each other little critiques. I pop in there as frequently as I can to just kind of lend as much help as I can. It's a great way to also contact to me and just talk about art in general. But there are also really, really fun things like a bonus catalog of over 50 exclusive hour-long lessons to make sure that you're always inspired, you always have a new lesson to go back to. I post new ones every month and it's a really fun, diverse catalog. So go check that out if you're interested. I also do one-on-one -on -one little art critiques. But with that said, let's, let's get back into the painting. Let's continue talking about the materials. Here I have a small dish. I like to fill this with water to clean my brushes. And it's also going to help us a lot with glazing, which we'll talk about in just a second. But I also have a cloth here. This is just to wipe off my excess paint and water. I have a picture frame. This is essentially a fantastic palette because it's very easy to clean. Then in regards to brushes, we have a very limited number of them here today. I wanted to simplify it. I wanted to make it much easier. So today, here I have a larger square headed brush. It is two centimeters wide. I like this one a lot because it can hold a lot of paint and it has a nice sharp edge. Then I have a medium sized square headed brush. It is one centimeter wide. And I like this because it's a little bit more detailed but can still carry a good amount of paint. Then finally, I have the smaller square headed brush. It is half a centimeter wide, and I like this because it's fantastic for detail work. We'll talk more about the brushes and their advantages in the actual lesson, but let's talk about paint. If you look to the right and left of the canvas, you will see a titanium white and a Mars black and nothing else, which is probably a little bit confusing. You saw the thumbnail, you saw how vibrant a painting this becomes, but there are only, there are only two pigments here. That's because I'm going to do the base layer with an achromatic palette. And that is essentially when you're doing a painting with white, black, and gray. And I'm going to do the entire base layer with that because it helps us 
break the painting down into varying steps so that we can build a depth much, much more easily. When you're painting in black and white, you can build depth really easily because depth is essentially just how dark or light something is in relation to something else. And we'll talk about that extensively in the lesson. These trees will be a great lesson for that. But when we interject color into that, it becomes so much more complicated because so many of us have preconceived notions whether a color is bright or dark, when really all colors have a great range, can be bright or dark. So this simplifies it. Then once we have that achromatic palette, we'll do a glaze of all of our color and we'll make it very nice and vibrant. And while we're doing that, we'll know that our depth is entirely correct. So it just, it makes that so much easier. I will teach you how to go through that glazing process and I will talk about the benefits of the achromatic palette palette as we do this. I've been painting for over a decade now and this still helps me figure out depth in my paintings. So I highly, highly recommend it as a painting process. So I will also list all of the additional paints we'll be using in the video description that we'll be using later for the color. But with that said, let's jump into today's hour-long painting lesson. So now I have my little water dish filled. I have my Mars black and titanium white on my palette and we're going to get into the painting. So I'm going to begin here by taking my larger square headed brush. Again, this is two centimeters wide. I'm going to make sure that the tip of it is damp. So I'm going to add a little bit of water and then wipe off the excess. This is going to help me drag my paint farther, extend the wet life of my paint so I get to blend better and just do a lot more. So then I'm going to take some titanium white and I'll move it out into a clean spot on my palette. And I want to mix a lighter to medium gray for my background. So I'm going to grab just hints of Mars black to begin with because it's a much stronger pigment than titanium white. And if you add an equal mix of both, you'll get a very dark pigment. So I'm slowly just interjecting this Mars black, blending it about. And then before I go to add this pigment to my palette, I'm going to blend it out here well on my, or before I add it to my canvas, I'm going to blend it out here well on my palette. That way I have an even distribution of gray across here rather than a mixture of whites and blacks. Then I'm going to take this and I'm just going to start applying it to my background. And this is going to be the color of light that is going to be shining through the forest for the most part. So you have a couple of options here. You can work around your trees like this using the sharp edge of your brush, or you can work on top of your trees. It's entirely dependent upon, I think, how you drew the subjects. If you feel like the drawing will show through, then by all means go over it. But if you feel like you'll have to redraw all of the trees, you might as well work around them. I'm doing the same with the butterfly, and that's why I like this brush so much. It can hold so much paint because it is so wide, but also it has these really nice sharp edges, which is great for working around the sharper edges in our foreground. So that's exactly what I'm doing there. Now I'm going back to add a little bit of additional water to my brush, and I do that because the damp brush effect only lasts so long and you need to continuously work that back into your mixture. But you don't want too much of it, otherwise it'll thin your paint to the point where you have to do a lot of layers. Water is a fantastic medium because it allows you to kind of move your paint out so much farther, get much softer blends, extend the wet life of the paint, but it also thins it. And that can be an issue when it's too thin because then you have to do a lot of layering. So here I'm trying to find that happy medium balance and as you can see, I'm just continuing to apply the pigment. And if I find that it's getting a little bit streaky, then I just apply less pressure with my brush. You get more streaks in application when you apply more pressure and when you are more firm with your brush because it pushes the paint to either side of it. So if you want a nice soft application, try to be delicate with the brush. So here I'm just working my way down these trees. When I'm in the background and I'm working around subjects, I generally like to do all of the edging first and then I'll go back in and work on the middle because that area doesn't need to be as precise and you're going to have the most precise stroke when your brush is recently wet and when you have 
a new amount of paint on there. So, just things to consider. Again, here I'm going to work on both of the outskirts of this open area, and then once they're complete, I move in. I'm being a little bit messy, and you can see that I am working on top of the trees and butterflies to an extent, but I'm leaving them for the most part so that I know where they are. And that way, again, I don't, I don't have to go back in and redraw it. I should be able to see the pigment through, um, or the drawing through the pigment, because we did use the fine-tipped Sharpie, but this is kind of just a cautionary way of going about it. And when you're beginning, it's a good way to kind of practice. I always like to begin the painting in the background because it makes layering much more easy as you work towards the foreground, but it's also just a great way of practicing and warming up your motor skills as you get into the painting. A lot of us don't paint every single day, and because of that, if you take a week off, sometimes the, the motor skills are a little bit rusty and you need a little bit of practice. Backgrounds are generally significantly less detailed and a little bit more loose. So by starting in the background, you kind of have this opportunity to practice your skills, get everything better. If it looks a little bit more rough, that's okay because it's kind of meant to as a background. You don't want all of your detail back there because if you do that, it's going to look like it's competing with the foreground. You want the foreground to be very high contrast, very sharp, um, very detailed, and the background to be less of all of those things. And you make that decision so that the foreground stands out. It's also much more natural because, of course, the eye can only perceive so much detail in something that's far away. Where when it's up close, we get a much better representation of all of the little pieces that make up a structure. So just something to consider. Now as I move over here to the right hand side of the painting, this way, I'm going to start working in a little bit more Mars black paint. And I'm going to do this because I want the light from my paint to be emitting around here. So as I get farther away, we get farther away from the light, we build a slight gradient, and with it, depth. Because depth is created when you have a change of value. And value, again, refers to how dark or how light something is. If it's very close to white, it has a very light value. If it's very close to black, it has a dark value. There's everything in between. But progressively changing that is how you're going to achieve depth. And we'll talk more about that as we, we work on the trees. But I'm slowly going to make this a little bit darker as we get farther and farther away from that light. It makes sense, right? The farther you get away from light, the darker something is. And that's really the foundation of creating depth in paintings, really anything. It's how we perceive it. I'm also going to make the ground area, the bottom portion, a little bit darker than the top, so I'm going to take some of this dark pigment and work it back this way, just at the bottoms, and then I'll blend it up softly. Doesn't have to be perfect, this is a forest, there are going to be lots of trees in the background here. Here we're getting into some genuinely dark mixtures as we move towards the right hand side. You can also probably see off the canvas that my pinky is out, and I know that might look kind of funny. It's so that I get to brace it on different things, whether it be the canvas or the backboard here, and it steadies my hand so that I can make a more concise stroke. It's one of those neat little tricks that takes that shake out of your hand in delicate detailed areas. And while we're creating all of these sharp lines, that might be something that's important to us. There we go. Just a little bit more to do over here on this right hand side. My pigment was starting to get a little bit too watery, so that time I didn't grab any water, just because I didn't want it to get too transparent. Again, adding a little bit more of that dark pigment to the bottom, blending it up. 
nice and easy using a very soft application. Now, it can be really easy to zoom in and focus on one area and then not look at it as a whole. So, something I would highly implore you to do is physically stand up if you're sitting down, take five or six steps back from your painting and just make sure that the gradient is kind of progressing as you'd like it to. It's not going to be light and then dark. You want it to be light, kind of medium, getting darker, dark. You want it to stretch as far as you can to create the most kind of vast impact that you can. So that's great. Now I'm going to work over on this side. I'm going to go back to making a much brighter pigment. So I kind of have a little bit of that bright pigment of this mix here on my palette. I'm going to use that as a reference. I generally like to mix on top of, that way I get to continue to use the pigment we were using and just edit it slightly so that it fits into the context of the painting, but I like to leave a little bit on the edges. That way I know what pigment I used initially and I can remix it if I need to. So here I'm going to take some of that titanium white, mix it back into that very dark pigment we have. It's still kind of dark, so I'll add a bit more titanium white, and this is really just trial and error, getting it back to as bright as it once was. But it's really so much easier doing this than it could be uh, if we had color. It would be so much more difficult if not only we were remixing the value, but we were mixing the color as well. And this is why it's such a great way for beginners to paint, because it's giving you the opportunity to learn everything kind of spaced apart and at a reasonable pace. You don't have to do everything at once. And again, I've been painting for over a decade now, and it still helps me just kind of articulate values and things. I'm taking a little bit of this mixture and I'm moving it back over here. The mixture was slightly brighter than what I had on the canvas, and I really liked it a lot. So I figured I'd interject this in here and just create a little bit more of a bright area. Now I'll continue moving to the left in my painting. Again, starting with the edges. Don't have to be perfect, but try to do as well as we can. Might as well. Here I'm mixing up more of that paint. And just applying that, starting with the edges. Here I'm using the corner of my brush for some of the smaller, more detailed areas. Remember that when you're using a square-headed brush, and I had, I had someone, uh, a really, really nice uh, member of the community actually, mentioned in the last video, Ryan, you always call these flat-headed brushes, um, or square-headed brushes, but they're not square-headed brushes, they're, they're flat-headed brushes. I'm like, I know, I know, it's just, it's a much more intuitive way, I think, of describing the brush for someone who's new and doesn't know the actual terminology for a brush, because a flat-headed brush, you might uh, kind of confuse it for a filbert or so many other different types of brushes that if you say it looks like a square, well, that's, that's pretty intuitive. Um, but the brush here, it does have this nice sharp corner, and when you apply pressure to it, it kind of has the backing of all of these other bristles, so it stays fairly strongly there. So you can kind of paint with just the corner of it and get a much more detailed application with it than you would otherwise. Just something to consider. There we go. That's nice. Here we're using the corner, just kind of working our way into those small areas working on the edges, and then bringing it back. You're also noticing that the side here is a little bit darker than this middle area. I did try to progressively move that into a slightly, slightly darker value. Not dramatically, it doesn't need to be. But that way we're still creating depth and we don't have a flat area. Generally things look like cartoons when they're entirely flat, when you don't have a change of value. 
And again, when you're using color, it can be difficult to articulate, but when you have just black and white, you can see how dark or bright something is. So now we know definitively this area is kind of a middle gray, this is kind of a lighter gray, and then this is a dark gray. And through that, we have the implication of light right here, and then it gets farther away on either side. So that's a great start to our painting. Now I'm going to put this brush down. I just kind of wet it to make sure that the acrylics don't dry on it. I tried to get as much off as I could on here and on here. But now I'm switching to the medium sized square headed brush. Again, it is one centimeter wide. I'm going to do the same thing I did to the other one. I'm going to make the tip of it nice and wet. And then we're going to work on these trees. And these trees are really where we get a fundamental knowledge of depth. So when things are very far away in the painting, they're generally perceived to be smaller. So you have these trees here in the background, which might actually be the same size as these larger ones in the foreground, but because they're so far away, they're going to look smaller. Also, because they're so far away, they're going to be wrapped in light and atmospheric light. So when things get farther and farther away in a painting, they don't have their innate coloring. When something's very close to you, you can see all of the colors naturally that are in it. When it's farther away, you get a lot of reflections from the colors that are around it, from the sky, from whatever else might be in that atmosphere. So we don't get a proper stark color when it's far away. Instead, it's muted and it's blending more with the rest of the colors. So. I want to paint this tree right here. This tree right here, again, is the same size perhaps as this one, maybe even bigger, but it's farther away so it looks smaller. I'm going to take a little bit of Mars Black just to darken the pigment we have very minorly. The pigment that we used here on the canvas, I'm using that, it's just a little bit darker. And then, I'm going to make my strokes. And as you can see, it's going to look fairly small but that's just because it's so far away. And it's also not that dark for a tree, right? And that's because it has all of the light kind of surrounding it. Now you can continue making additional trees of the pigment that's left. Here I don't have one drawn, but I'll just kind of come up with it on my own. And you can see that this one, again, it's very subtle. It's even more subtle. And that means it's probably just a little bit farther away than the one that we just painted. And I'll do another one, and as I continue to do this, I lose paint on my brush, it kind of blends with what's currently on the canvas, and you get more and more subtle impressions as you go. So the trees just look farther and farther away. It's a really fun technique. So now let's move a little bit in the foreground. This tree is closer to us, so it's going to be a bit darker because we get to see more of its natural coloring. It doesn't have all of that light surrounding and kind of engulfing it. So here you can see that we have a little bit more Mars Black in our mixture, and it's going to stand out more so than the trees in the background, which is exactly what we want. And we need that range of them. We need some of them to look subtle, far away, covered in light, and we need some to look much more stark, like they're close to us. This is another area where you want to begin on the edges and then you kind of work your way into the middle for the best effect. But now we can go back in the painting again. So I'll add a little bit more titanium white. We'll make a mixture that's closer to that background and I'll just make up another tree right here. And this one, as you can see, it's incredibly subtle. You almost don't see it at all. And that's great, that's a, a fantastic thing to have. Don't worry that you're not doing anything in that, you're creating all of this incredibly subtle detail. And that tree looks so much farther away than that one. Again, probably a similar size, but that's not how we perceive it. Now I want to create some more depth in my painting, so I'll create another tree right here, but I'll make it even more stark. So this will be even closer to us. I'll get some extra Mars black, because again, it's getting farther and farther away from the light and we'll apply this one. I'm trying to kind of cover up all of the 
white that I have left on the canvas with these, but then I'm also creating additional branches however feels natural. I'm not staying entirely concise to the drawing, I am adding to it where I see fit. And I think that's just a good way to paint as things evolve. With that said, the digital sketch that I have up over on Patreon will be of the final version of this, so you don't have to worry about kind of guessing where I'm adding things. You will have the definitive version of where everything ended up. So right now, we have a lot of depth because we have things that look very far away and very close. But you can also build additional depth around individual subjects. You've built depth in the atmosphere, we've built depth in the landscape, but each individual subject can have its own depth as well. So I'm going to take a little bit of extra titanium white, mix that into our mixture, and then if the light's coming from here, really this middle area, then everything on the left hand side of it, the subject is going to have a highlight on the right hand side of it. So the side of the subject that is facing the light is going to get a little bit of a highlight like this. So here I'm just adding a little bit of a brighter color and then I'm blending it back. So let's say that the main subject is over here. It's on the right side of our light source. We could have it with a much darker body. So here you go, it has a, a much darker middle area and we'll go back and we'll do the rest in a little bit. But for the lesson's sake, then we take some brighter gray and then we'll throw it here on the left hand side because the left hand side is closest to that light. So that's really how you build depth on an individual subject. The side of it that is facing the light source is going to be slightly brighter than the side that is not. And I said slightly, it's going to depend depending upon how close the light source is to your subject. If the light source is very close to your subject, the light may entirely engulf the subject, like it does the trees that are in the distance, or if it's kind of a, a close-up light source against a close-up subject, you're going to have a very dramatic contrast. So there'll be very bright white, and then there'll be a very dark black. And probably not an entirely white or an entirely black, but something very close to those two. So here I'm just kind of going back and I'm continuing to add that depth. But it's worth noting, I'm only going to be doing this to the trees and subjects here that are getting closer and closer to us. The ones that are in the background aren't going to have this light wrapping around them because they already have it, again, I'm going to use the word engulfing it, um, as it wraps entirely around it. And it's almost like this uh, shroud of mist. So just something to consider while you're doing your painting. If the subject is very far away, it might not have that light wrapping around it entirely or wrapping around portions of it like the foreground, it may wrap around it entirely. So here I'm just continuing. I'm trying to make sure that my trees are always different from one another. So here I had that branch go up that way and then this one kind of went up at the same angle so I put a bend in it. You want to make sure that your tree branches are always evolving and changing. That's how it's going to look the most natural. And you want to avoid having them straight up for the most part. I try to put a lot of them on slight angles and introduce little bends and curves. So here, this one's going to now bend off to the right. And they always, of course, get a little bit wider as you get towards the bottom. So the top is more pinched, it gets smaller and smaller, the bottom gets wider and wider, and that's just so it can support the weight of the tree. So it's very logical, and really that's, that's how you should think about trees, with logic, because it's, it's quite straightforward. Think of trees as straightforward, not straight upward. It's kind of an art joke. Anyways, we have a lot of these trees right here. And you know what? They are evenly spaced out. This has the same amount of space as this and this. That's not what you want. You don't want that much repetition. It doesn't look natural. So I'm going to take some extra 
Mars black and that dark gray mixture and I'm just going to fill in this area. Now we have this space, this space, and then we have two very different spaces. So we've changed it up dramatically with one little stroke and you want that diversity in between each tree. Then I'm going to mix up some brighter trees. So I'm taking a lot more titanium white and I'll throw those kind of in the background here as well. Just to make it a little bit more interesting and again create more depth in that area. There we go. We can also have some fun and have trees that go almost diagonally that are kind of falling. So here I'll create one like this and then maybe it has a branch that moves out like that. Gets lost up there. There's another piece of it. That's a nice way to kind of spread the eye from one area of the painting to the other using these very subtle leading lines. And a leading line is just a subject in the painting that kind of pulls the eye in one direction or another. So, we're going to continue. Going to make one of these trees here a little bit brighter in the background. I want it to still be darker than the background, but it's going to be lighter than these ones. And I just want the idea that there's this massive tree in the background that is covered with this fog. And then I'll take some of that excess paint and I'll just create some additional little trees in here. Nice and easy. So I'm going to continue now to the right and when we get very far over to this side we're going to get much darker but we want it to be a subtle progression from one to the next. So I'm still slowly going to be adding these slightly darker pigments as we move in that direction. There we go. Something I'd also like to note, I'm holding the brush for the most part, as you can see, like a pencil. And that isn't how you're traditionally taught to paint, it wasn't how I was taught to do so in university. And I like to bring this up in a number of lessons just because I think it's important. Um, because it's a way of creating a lot of sharp detail and making sure everything is exactly where you want it. It's the way we were taught to hold a pencil and it's the way we are, most of us anyway, are used to working with a, a, a very sharp application. However, some people kind of have an issue creating fluidity and motion, movement in their painting and it kind of looks stiff. And a lot of that can happen from this very small stroke, this very meticulous application. And what you actually need to do if you're one of those people and you do find that you're falling into that, hold your brush from back here and kind of move your arm and your shoulder a little bit more to create the stroke rather than your wrist. This is going to make it a little bit more difficult um, initially but it's going to give you a lot more flow and control and it'll make your strokes look more natural. It isn't something you have to do. I, I am not a believer in the uh, words have to in the creation of art. I think you need to do whatever you want to do. But if you do find that you're ending up with stiff paintings, try holding the brush like this and making larger strokes. You can still move in one area very specifically like that, or you can kind of just take edges and move like that. Now this tree, it's much closer to us. As you can see, we're finally moving into the uh, middle ground of the painting. So I'm going to make the back of it darker. So what we currently have is the highlighted edge from the light, then I'm going to go to the right hand side because it's opposite to the light and I'm going to add some dark pigment 
to make it a little bit more uh, standout-ish, kind of pop in the painting. And we're going to continue doing that. So you can make a subject pop and have depth by wrapping light around it, around the side that is facing the light, or you can add shadow and darkness to the side that is opposite to the light. Again, if you are new to acrylic painting and you really just want to get uh, your technical st skill and understanding of depth up, painting forests with a light source in an area is a really, really efficient way of getting an understanding of that because it's a lot of repetition and following the very simple rules over and over again. And I say very simple rules, I know initially it can be kind of difficult to grasp and, and to work through, but again, once you do a forest or two, you will understand how to go about that and you'll have a, a good grasp of what pigments are lighter and darker. But again, that's why we're working here with the achromatic palette, the white, black, and gray, because we don't have to worry about color and we can really just isolate value how bright or dark the subject is in the painting. I'm actually going to go over a couple of these here kind of in the middle and make a little bit of them slightly brighter on the side that's touching the light. I've just been looking at it for a while now and thinking, you know what, we could, we could improve on that a little bit. So I'm just going back. At this point, it's all dry, so I'm blending wet on top of dry which is something that gives you a less smooth look, but that is okay. It's going to look like paint strokes. Um, or if you have a, a fair amount of water and you're blending wet over dry, you can get a perfectly smooth gradient, but it's not something I'm aiming for here. I am okay with the more brush strokey look. I do like painting. I like the aesthetic of paint and I, I don't feel the need to make it look like a photograph. If you are into hyperrealism, then I think that is a wonderful endeavor to kind of dive into. There is a lot to learn, but I, I do like to let the paint show a little bit, as I love paint itself. And there really isn't a right or wrong in it. It's, uh, it's personal preference, it's subjective, and it's the type of art you would like to make. I've actually been trying to make my stroke a little bit more loose this year. Having everything slightly less refined and more flowing. Here you can see I'm just going back over areas. Sometimes when you use water you need to do a couple of applications just because it makes the paint fairly transparent. Acrylic paints are innately fairly transparent on their own, and when you add water, they really become personifications of that. So, with that said, I'm just going to mix up a little bit more of a darker gray, kind of finish up the trees that I have over here on the left-hand side of the painting. Create some really thin, dark ones. This will give the painting some extra detail. There we go. Have the tree kind of split off into a couple of pieces there. Just creating some extra strokes, making it a little bit more interesting. And I'm also jumping around to a point. And I do this so that I don't continue to create the same stroke in the same area and accidentally subconsciously create patterns. Sometimes when you're doing the same area for too long, you kind of rest on these subconscious techniques and you just incorporate them and incorporate them and incorporate them to the point where it gets mundane and you look at the back of the painting and you say, hey, that all looks the same. And it's just because we didn't move around enough. So if you feel like you're kind of falling into that trap, just try to move around a little bit and it will make a big difference. We're almost done with the trees here, which is nice. Really happy with how these turned out. 
just kind of going back into some of them and darkening edges, making some more defined, stand out to a greater degree. You can also do some small little ones that don't go up as far. It'll look like they're either getting lost in the light or it'll look like a smaller tree, both of which are neat and welcome. There we go. Now we're going to continue by cleaning off our brush a little bit. And then you see these little patches of land down here in the middle ground. Those could be fairly light if they have a lot of this light reflecting on them. They could be fairly dark if they don't have any. It's going to kind of depend on the um, amount of mist in the atmosphere on how wet everything is. If everything has a little bit of dew on it, then it's going to be highly reflective and it's going to be brighter. So let's try by making it fairly bright initially. And then if we don't like it, we can make it darker. We're going to begin though by making it light because it's much easier to make a pigment darker than it is lighter because the dark pigments are just a lot stronger. So here I'm working in between my trees I have this little patch of land. You know what, I'll make, a, I'll make an even brighter one and I'll create a second little patch right behind. I'm using the corner of my brush for that really detailed work. And you know what, I actually like that a lot. I think that's nice. I'll work a little bit of this brighter pigment into this back patch over here on the right. Working it in between my trees, as you know. Then we'll mix it with a bit of a darker pigment. And as we move forward in the painting, just like with the trees, we're going to make it slightly darker because it's getting farther and farther away from the light. There we go. This isn't in the reference photo I used. I did change the reference photo up a little bit but I just wanted to give it a little bit more depth, have some land in there, just make it interesting. So now I kind of have this bright foreground area. It's very reflective. It's catching a lot of light. And then we move a little bit farther away into another mound and it's a bit darker. And then as we get closer and closer, it gets darker and darker. That said, I don't want it to be actually dark because I want to save actually dark for my foreground. So I still want it to be in those shades of gray. I'm also going to darken the highlight on the ground just a little bit so it doesn't pop to a great extent. I want it to be a subtle, nice addition to the painting. I don't want it to be the main attraction. And that's another important lesson. Don't always make everything in your painting highly refined or poppy, otherwise you won't be able to pay attention to the detailed areas. Your eyes just won't know what to do. You want to make some areas of the painting much more subtle, uh, softer, less high contrast. That way other areas can really pop. So I'm just about done with the forest element of it here. I'm just doing little touch-ups around. But now I'm going to, I suppose, just touch up a couple more areas. I'm getting ready to stand up and get a, a better look at the painting, but I keep seeing little things that I want to uh, just kind of refine a little bit. So that's what I'm doing right now. At the top, you can kind of see little areas that are still white because I just didn't go over them with additional branches. So I'm going over a couple of those right now and I'm filling in areas. However, it's okay if things are left unfinished because we are going to be doing some glazing on top of it, which we will talk about how to do that in just a little bit, but I'm just giving it a nice base layer. So I'm going to stand up, take a couple steps back and give it an honest look to make sure I can move on and don't need to do any big changes. 
So upon stepping back from the painting, I realized that this area right here actually has a tree and a little bit more land. And I could have missed that and went on to the foreground if I, I didn't step back and do that. Otherwise I kind of finished that area, I had my focus there, I didn't kind of get a good overview of the painting and I know that sounds ridiculous because you could just look over to the right, but sometimes unless you actually physically get up, take a couple of steps back and do it, you don't really have that natural, uh, that full perspective. So I'm going to finish this area right here, which I didn't, and you know, it's, it's entirely okay to say that we make mistakes in painting. I think one of the wonderful things that really drew me to painting initially was just how malleable it is. It is the perfect medium to make mistakes, learn, and then paint over them. I kind of, oh, I love drawing. Something that I never really loved about the medium itself is just how certain it is, how definite it is. You put down a line, and yes, you can erase it, but there will still probably be a mark on your page. And I love that paint, you can just continuously cover things up and, and retry. So it's a great medium for those of us who are willing to be honest when we make mistakes and are ready and willing to do our best at continuing to make the best thing we can. So don't get disheartened if you kind of miss an area or an area doesn't work out as perfectly as you like. You can always go back just as I am right here and fix it up. So here I'm just using that sharp edge of the square headed brush, working my way around these trees, creating this slightly darker foreground, which I'll blend more so into the middle ground a little bit, just a couple of strokes here and there. And just like that, the area is now done. So we're done with the background. We've established how to create depth and now we're moving forward in the painting. As we get closer to us, we see the innate coloring and sharpness of subjects. They don't have all of this atmospheric light, which is going to soften them. And they're going to be much more poppy, which means we need to use much more bright brights and dark darts. We're moving less out of the middle ground and more into the dramatic side of things. So I'm going to begin here by actually switching back to the larger square head brush and I'm going to work in this area. This is kind of a divot in this tree, it's kind of hollow and no light is getting into this area because light's coming this way and this is facing the opposite direction. So it might get a little bit of reflected atmospheric light but again there isn't a lot here in the foreground so it needs to be very dark. And it's a large area so I'm going to switch over to this larger square headed brush. So I'll take this and I'll apply it right here in the middle of our palette. Take a little bit of titanium white just because I don't want to work with a pure black. It'll be easier to glaze over with a little bit of color if it's slightly more in the grays. And then I'll work around the edges and just run my butterfly I'm using the corner of my brush here for these very detailed areas. I'm just filling it in. Now before I do too, too much, yet again, I'm going to stand up and head a couple feet away just to see that the value of this is dark enough in relation to everything else, that it does stand out. And I'm actually going to look through my monitor on my camera to help me do that as well because it makes everything look so much farther away because it's so much smaller. You could do the same thing with a cell phone. And now, I do like it, so I'm going to just continue filling this in as I was. And this can look fairly flat because you can't see depth or light wrapping around subjects when something is just dark. It's going to look much more flat. And that's okay, we can have negative space in the painting a negative space just refers to an area that is much more simple and generally doesn't have your main subject and it's just kind of a, a place for the eye to rest if it gets there or not to focus on at all because it isn't the most interesting piece of the painting. And again, you need a balance of interesting and 
supportive, and this can be kind of a supportive area. Now as I move out here towards the edge, I'm going to work in a little bit more titanium white, make it into a bit of a brighter gray, because that light is going to catch this area because it protrudes, and a little bit of light can get in there. Not much, but a little bit. So there we go. It isn't a dramatic change, but it is a good one. And again, stepping a couple feet back, giving the paint a good, a good look, and I really like that. So, yet again, we can proceed. Now, right here in between this negative space and the background, there is a little bit of the tree, the side of the bark that's showing through, and I'm going to switch to my medium-sized square-headed brush for this. It's going to catch a little bit of light because it isn't facing in the opposite direction of this, it's just kind of flat, and so it'll get a little bit of reflected light. So I'm going to take some titanium white, mix up this more medium gray, and create these nice little sharp edges and implications for this area. That first application was a little bit too wet, so it's going to be difficult to paint with. If I move it around, it'll get very thin, so I'm just going to leave that area for now, focus on the ones that I am yet to do with this more pigment-based application. It doesn't have as much water. When I went back to my dish, I didn't uh, grab as much, and here you can see I'm just adding extra paint into the brush and mixture and not water. So here, just throwing on a couple of these little areas, just like that. And then I'll add a slight highlight to the edge, just for where the light might be hitting and wrapping around. And I'm allowing it to be kind of rough, so I'm not, I'm not too concerned about a perfectly clean stroke here, and that's the case because we're working on kind of a rough wood, the inside of it. it. It's not meant to be perfect, it's meant to be cracked and have these little indents and different things happening in it. So there I'm just working with it in that way, and then I might even put a little crack in the wood going back here that has a little bit of light showing through. You can do that in a couple of areas if we want, have it come down and then in. Just like that. It'll make it a little bit more interesting. It won't have a big effect on the painting, but it is a, a nice little touch that we can add. And you can have hints of light just kind of working in from that side. But you don't need them. Now we're going to move on in the painting, and we're going to move forward. And that's essentially what we're always trying to do. So our next inclination would be work on this, but forward in the painting we actually see this area right here. And this is the same thing that this is. It's a hole in the log where no light is getting to. So I'm going to mix up a bit of that darker pigment again with the larger 2 centimeter square headed brush. I'm going to throw that together, and then I'll work again along the edges. I would like to note that I'm using this brush, and I, I say that it's two centimeters, but that shouldn't make you feel like you need to use one of this exact size. Please feel free to try different ones. I very much feel like it's, uh, mind the pun, <laughs> different strokes for different folks. It's really about what you prefer. If you like a more bold stroke, if you like a more detailed small stroke, this is really an in-between choice um, for those of us who kind of like kind of like both. Um, so that's what I'm doing here, but it's also going to change if your canvas is a larger size, then you might want to use a larger brush or a smaller size, you might want to use a smaller brush, but again, you can really use whatever you'd like. I just had a, a lot of requests to share the uh, actual sizing of the brush, and I don't love to do that because again, I don't feel like it's something you really should feel like you need to follow to a T, um, but perhaps, perhaps it can help a couple of you, and you know what, if it's helping a couple people, then, then it's a good thing. So, here I'm just kind of continuing to fill in this little opening here, 
I'm using the corner of my brush for these detailed areas, just like that. And I'm going to make a slightly brighter dark gray, and I'll work on the edges of the bark with this. So these are kind of facing opposite to the light, but they're not in this kind of dark miniature trench, right? It's not in this almost cavern-like subject. So it'll be a little bit brighter. Not much though. Again here I'm using the corner to craft this nice little sharp edge and I'll do that over here as well. That's good. Now, again, we're going to move forward in the painting and I'm going to save the butterflies for the very, very end because I want to put the most detail and attention on them because I want them to pop the most. So I'm going to move down to this left-hand corner. I have some moss and it moves up onto this, um, this wood here. So I'm going to switch for the moss to the medium size square headed brush because I need to cover a fair amount of space but not too, too much. So I'm going to grab a, a fairly dark pigment, some Mars Black, and I'm going to create the base layer first. A little bit of titanium white, and I'll just throw on a very basic flat layer. We need to make it a little bit brighter because it's too close to that. So throw in a little bit of titanium white, mix that into what we already have here. There we go. Again, work my way around the butterfly using those sharp edges to help me do so. And then as I get towards the edge that's facing the light, I can be a little bit brighter. I can take a hint more titanium white paint and work that in because that side will be closer to the light and it will be illuminated slightly more than the rest. Again, I'm just building a base layer at this point. I'm not worried about my stroke or anything like that. We will add detail in just a minute. But I will continue building that out right here. Again, working in the butterfly. And I've missed a bit of the tree in this area, so I'm going to see if I can just fill it in with this gray See how close they are, they're very close, that worked really well. And then I'll move forward in the painting. And I'm just going to move to where I think the moss will stop. I'll have it kind of come up to there maybe. Continuously mixing more paint. I don't like to mix too much paint in one uh, area or application just because I like going back to it. I find that makes me a better uh, paint mixer and it helps me articulate values and colors better because I'm continuously having to make them. If I were to make a bunch, then I wouldn't have that repetition and I just wouldn't learn as quickly. I might forget things. So there we go. That essentially, for the most part, can be moss. You can see that the edges are a bit more rough. I'm not too concerned. I will be going over a bit of it with a, a wooden texture. But I'm going to stand up and just make sure I like the values again. And I think that's going quite well. Now I'm going to let this dry for a minute. Um, because if we were to go in and add highlights to it right now, then it would just blend with what we had and we wouldn't get anything that really stands out nicely. So because it's the foreground and I want it to pop, I'm going to let that dry and then we'll blend wet onto dry in about five minutes or so. So now we're back and two things happened. One, the sun came back out so the painting looks a little bit less blue in the shadows. But two, this is dried for the most part, so we can go in and add some texture to our moss. And for this, for the first time, I'm going to take my smaller square-headed brush. Again, this one is about half a centimeter wide. I'm going to make sure that it's nice and damp, and I want this to be extra damp because I'm going to be blending wet on top of dry, and I'm going to want a relatively smooth application. 
So I'm going to take some titanium white, move this up to a brighter area on my palette because I know I want the pigment to be brighter. I'll take a hint of Mars Black and I made something a little too dark there. So I'll take some extra titanium white, mix that in there, and I like that mixture. Remember, it's so, so easy to kind of go overboard with the darker pigments, so make sure that you're being relatively careful with that. Now with the corner of my brush, I'm going to tap on a little bit of these little mounds and textures for the moss. And I'm going to do that using the corner and then I'm creating these little bumps up and down and I'm trying to make sure that the start of my application is very tiny and then as I continue in the application I apply more pressure to the brush which expands the bristles and makes a larger application and then as I get towards the end I apply less pressure and make it smaller. So here I'm applying more pressure, it's larger, it's larger, I'm getting towards the end, it's smaller, it's smaller, it's almost unnoticeable. And I'm going to do that a fair number of times, and I'm just going to start connecting these randomly. Again, if you have the digital sketch, then you know exactly how these are going to look and how they're meant to be connected. But I'm also going to do some kind of solitary ones and some little taps for additional pieces of moss. And you're getting this effect right here because they have all of these little pieces that are jetting out and the tops of them here are catching light and that light is wrapping down around them. But then as you get towards the bottom in that kind of crevice of the two pieces of moss, you have this shadow because light can't get there. So you're just creating the tops of all of the moss here with your highlights. And some pieces are just going to be little and kind of pop up naturally and others are going to be much larger and kind of connect to one another. If you do too many, don't you worry about it. You can always wet your brush, take a little bit more extra Mars Black, mix together a darker pigment that's fairly close to the pigment that you had initially here on the bark or on the tree here, and you can just kind of spice that in as well. It'll just give it some extra texture and, and an interesting look at that. So here you can see I'm just kind of dropping that in. Lots of little places that I don't even need to cover up, just because it's a slightly different value and it'll make it slightly more interesting. Now I'm going to go back to that lighter pigment and I mixed it slightly with my darker pigment because I wanted to get progressively darker as we move farther down on this area here because remember this side it's getting a lot of light but as you get farther and farther down it's getting less and less light so I'm trying to kind of mitigate the highlights that we have that are being applied. Occasionally there can be one or two little brighter areas but for the most part you do want it to be dark. And I do have the slightly area, slightly lighter areas just to create some additional diversity and make sure that it's still evolving and being nice and interesting. There we go. Working really well. Back here, it's going to be fairly dark, so I'm not applying too much. You can see it's almost unnoticeable. I'll go in with a couple slightly brighter highlights, but not much at all. Nothing in comparison to what we have up there. So it's always just kind of randomly tap squiggly applications. Some are literal, just little taps and drags, and others are that pattern where it's smallest and then it gets larger and then it gets smaller. And in the middle area, it's just kind of random movements and I'm, I'm trying to keep it as organic as possible, being that it's such an organic substance. There we go. Now I'm going to move on to this right here, and this is going to be actual wood. So I'm going to switch to my medium-sized square-headed brush because we're covering a fair amount of space, but I do want it to be relatively detailed. I'm going to begin yet again by creating a darker base layer. So I'll just mix this up here on my palette, create something nice, nice and dark. And then I'll just kind of fill in this white area. 
but I'll move it into the moss through little strokes that are going on the same angle as the piece of wood itself. There we go. And then I'll extend it outwards, cover up most everything. Doing the edges first as we have throughout this entire painting. And then I'll kind of move my way in with my extra paint. And now you can see it's getting a little chalky. You can see the edges, it's not a crisp, clean application anymore. So I'll grab some extra paint, mix it up again. work my way around some edges while I have all of this new clean paint. Still using the corner of my brush for those very detailed areas. There we go. If you ever stop to just appreciate kind of how amazing paint is, you have this thing that's initially one, one value, one hue, it's just this canvas, and now you have so much detail, lines, impressions, markings, the way it kind of flows, it's, um, I just kind of had one of those moments of real appreciation. And it's uh, always really nice when you can still have that over 10 years into the process. There we go. This is very dark as you can see. And I'm going to splash a little bit of it with the corner of my brush into the bottom area of some of this moss, just so that it's cohesive. Here I almost have a very natural blend from one to the other. That's nice. Now, we waited to do the highlights for this, and as you can tell, we have these kind of uh, lesser highlights still. And that's because acrylic paint dries innately semi-transparently. We used water, which made it more transparent. So we didn't get that pure bright pigment that we had on our palette. Instead, we had a mix of it and the color that was underneath it, which was dark here. The same will happen for our wood, but we will definitely be mindful of it and come back in and do some extra highlights once it's all kind of applied. But I'm going to wait for this to dry entirely, that way we can come back in with a fresh application. I don't have to worry about it blending with that very dark pigment. And I also want the bark to look a little bit more rough and gritty, so I don't want a perfectly smooth blend anyway. So I'm going to let that dry, and then we'll be right back. This is a great time to change your water and to clean your brushes. These brushes are between a year and two years old. They are by Artist Loft. They are incredibly affordable. Some might say cheap, um, but they lasted as long as they have and they work as well as they do because I wash them very frequently and I don't let paint dry in them. So while I'm in the painting process, I'm always wetting them, cleaning them as I'm switching, and then I do a good clean a couple of times through the painting lesson as well as at the end. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to go do a good clean of my brushes, get some fresh water, and then we'll jump right back into this once it's dry. Now that our base layer has dried and we have new clean brushes and clean water, we can continue by adding on the highlights. So I'm going to begin, as I essentially always do, by making my brush slightly damp, taking off that excess paint, and now we'll mix up a highlight. And I have most of my highlights up here on the palette, so I'll mix it close to them. Right here, I'm fairly close, as you can see, I'm just kind of blending it over into that area so that I get to see really how it matches with that, and it is fairly bright. So it'll be a similar highlight to what we have over here. And I'm going to begin by making a fairly long confident stroke at the top of the bark, and then I'm going to start moving it in, applying more pressure here and there to create the effect 
of pieces of bark that are protruding. And then there will be these little divots like this here that will remain dark and that will be a part in between these two top pieces of bark that isn't receiving any light. And I'm trying to be fairly rough with this. So I'm moving my brush, I'm applying more pressure, less pressure, and then I'm just connecting different areas to show that different bark is existing like that. So you have these large pieces that are kind of connected and then you have some smaller, softer pieces. And now you can see it blends into the moss value-wise really well. There we go. We kind of want this maze to run in between all of them. And I'm just trying to keep it fairly random. With that said, again, if you're using the digital sketch, this will all be drawn out for you and this part of the process will be a lot easier. But as I get farther down, I'm going to mix in a little bit more Mars Black, make that highlight slightly less of a highlight, more of a mid-tone, and then I'll continue working these forward. Now I lost a little bit of the detail in here, so I'll just put that back. Now we have that nice division between this and the background again. And we'll just have some fun down here. Like that. So now we have the very basic top to our bark. From there, I'm going to switch back over to the smaller square headed brush where I can have more detail. I'm going to create an even brighter highlight. So I'm going to mix this kind of on top of everything and I'll grab a hint of that darker pigment to mix in, but it, this is very bright in comparison to the rest. And I'm going to start by layering this on the edge yet again. This will blend with our previously applied still wet pigment, but that's okay. I don't want it to be as dark as it was on the palette. I did account for that. And now I'm going to go to the areas that I feel like on the top bark pieces are going to have the most light and I'm just applying it in the same way, creating the secondary pattern in the protruding pieces. And that way it looks like the bark has multiple levels and it'll be a little bit more interesting. See all that extra texture we're building through this process? Now the sun just went down, so I'm going to check the monitor and make sure that it's still bright enough in the camera. There we go. And that looks good. We are, we are having a lucky day today with the sun. As you know, it's as I've mentioned a couple of times lately, it is winter here in Canada, so we get a lot of days that are kind of sunny, and then they're, they're kind of snowy, and then they're kind of sunny, and they're kind of cloudy, and it, and it mixes, and um, every five minutes it seems like we have something different. So it's kind of awkward to paint in because you don't have the exact same lighting situation throughout the whole painting, or even really through a half an hour bit, but it does show you how your painting is going to look in different times of the day and in varying weather conditions, which is really neat because generally if we just paint in daylight entirely, then we have this one view of the painting and then you put it up on your wall. And then of course, weather happens and, and the atmosphere changes and you get all these different lighting effects on it that you didn't consider when you painted it. But when you paint it like this in um, kind of questionable uh, cloudy days, you really get to see the full range of it. So there are, there are definitely positives to the inconsistency in lighting. Anyways, with that said, here you can see I'm just taking a little bit more of that highlight, working it back in to the texture. I'm just doing little taps here and there and trying to create these edges. I'm applying a lot of pressure as specifically at the bottom of my stroke so that I get these little lines and impressions of brighter pigment here. It's another one right there. And that's because all of the paint is being pushed to the bottom and it's kind of spewing out. And while that might not be the most attractive way of describing an occurrence, it's essentially just creating this harsh, sharp line at the bottom that's brighter than the rest because the top of it's blending with the other pigment and then the bottom is just kind of layering on top of it. And it's just a way of getting a very natural looking aesthetic. So again here, just applying a lot of pressure and I get that nice sharp bottom to it. 
I am going to take some of this highlight that we have right here, mix up a little bit more, and then I will throw this back onto the tops of our moss here. That way, value-wise, it connects with the bark and everything looks like it's kind of in the same uh, area perspective-wise. Nothing's farther back from the other. It all exists kind of on a very similar plane. So here I'm just doing those little taps, blending through texture and motion the moss into the bark. And then I'll pick a couple of areas back here to heighten as well. Then I'll take more of that highlight and I'll just continue adding it to the top of this bark where again you'll really get that highlight of the light in the back here touching it. And you want the foreground to be the most stark area. Remember the background? It's more of a wash of grays. The foreground you have these very dark pigments right next to these very light pigments and it's going to make it pop and draw the viewer's eye to that area. So just like that we have a a nice piece of really old kind of rotting wood and then we have the moss that's kind of consuming it. Here we'll do the lip of this and this should be, we'll make it a little bit brighter. It might not make sense that it's brighter as it's not getting any direct sun. It's kind of closer to this but I want to make it a little bit brighter just so it stands out in contrast to this background and that's what's called an artistic liberty. It's when you do something that doesn't make sense or doesn't follow the photograph or reality to kind of heighten the painting itself. And it's something that I very much like to do in my paintings. For me, painting is about creating a, a mood, an atmosphere, a feeling, um, and not necessarily capturing the subject for what it visually is, but more what it represents and, and those feelings. And I find that is best achieved when we're kind of a little bit more playful with our paint and what we're willing to do. With that said, you don't have to, you can make it quite dark. It will really stand in or get lost in the background, but it would naturally anyway, so that's okay. It's all, it's all about how you want to paint your painting. Here I'm going to define the edges a little bit more, doing a bit of a tap with the smaller square headed brush to create a nice sharper edge. Just like that. See it really stands out and I'll let the bottom be slightly more subtle. Now I'm going to take a couple steps back yet again Get a much wider perspective. I really like how this is turning out. Doing a great job here today. Now we're going to move on to this rock in the foreground. And I essentially tried to do this so I had a moss, or an area of moss here, a moss, an area of moss, uh, an area of wood, and then an area of rock. That way I had a variety of applications and texture styles. The reference photo I had just kind of had this a uh, piece of wood that was entirely covered in moss, but I wanted to do a little bit more and I wanted to diversify. So again, that's taking artistic liberties to kind of enhance the image itself. Now it's a large area, so I'm switching back to the larger square headed brush. This is very far away from the light. It is not really facing it, so this is going to be quite dark. So here I'm moving into the darker area of my mixtures with some Mars Black. I'll grab a hint of titanium white. This will help thicken the pigment, but again, avoid that purely dark black mixture that we could achieve very simply, but might not get the glazes um, working as well as they could. So here, I'll just put this down. Again, use the sharp edges to work around my subjects. And then as I get towards the top here, I'm going to work in a little bit more titanium white and I want it to be brighter than the kind of almost black that we have there. I still want it to stand out to a point. I want it to be nice and interesting. But it can't actually be bright because it can't 
kind of compete with the other areas that are bright. I want the edges to be slightly darker in the painting. You'll notice here it's a little bit darker, here it's darker, there you have that darker tree, here it's going to be darker. And I'm doing that to create a slight vignette so the eye is drawn towards the middle of the painting. For those of you who are unaware, a vignette is simply a slightly darker edge that surrounds a subject or a painting or a picture so that the eye goes to that middle area. Now rocks can be painted in so many different ways um, because some of them can be soft or hard or brittle or sandy and so it's really up to you. I have a fairly consistent stroke going on here so I'm going to continue that for the most part but I'm going to switch to the medium sized square headed brush so I have a little bit more detail. I'll grab slightly more titanium white, mix that in. I'll go around the edge that's going to catch the most light and then I'll create these kind of softer applications and blends just to create a couple levels on the rock. And what you want to do here, you want to pick slight areas that are protruding that are higher up and we're going to make them slightly brighter and then the areas that are a little bit divot down, they kind of swoop in, will make it darker. So it's, it's just, again, playing with light and creating depth in that same way. There we go. Kind of looks like an abstract shape or application there without any light or color, and that's, that's quite all right. I'm also going to switch now to the smaller square-headed brush and add a little bit of moss to it at the bottom and have it just kind of work its way up as well in the same way it did over here. That way it's all cohesive and everything kind of blends together on some level. Again, I'm just creating these little fissures, sometimes little taps, sometimes these strokes that start off really small, get slightly bigger and then get smaller. This of course is all still very wet, so it's blending, but I'm okay with that here where I wasn't there because this is meant to be darker. It's not supposed to have those highlights, so I can do these blends which are going to mute our values as opposed to those where I wanted them to stand out. In these applications and the highlights, I wanted to apply paint on top of paint. Here I'm trying to apply paint into paint and mix it. That way I do get a slightly more subtle application. With that said, I can always go back in like this and just heighten a couple areas should I want to with a very soft application and then as soon as I start to blend it, you can see that it gets much more gray. But if you want that almost pure white, just don't apply much pressure at all. Here I'm just kind of having fun with my rock. There we go. Now with that, we are actually done the background of the painting with the exception of this little area. I just saw that. I'm glad I saw that. Okay, so I have a little bit of this light gray. We're going to try it, hope it matches, and it matches. That's fantastic. Guess I can touch up a couple other little areas while I have this on my brush. When I go back to touch up one thing, it's really hard not to look for, not necessarily faults, but areas that could be improved and jump around. It's not what I'm trying to do right now. So I'm going to be responsible, I'm going to put the brush down, I'm going to take a couple of steps back, look at what we have here before we start on the butterflies and just make sure it's, it's what we want value-wise throughout. Okay, so I really like it, but these areas, these little crevices, are the darkest areas in the painting. Not this or this, and this and this are not receiving any light where this might get a little bit of reflected light. So I want to go in and I want to darken these just a little bit. I'm going to take the larger square headed brush, make sure that it's nice and damp, create a very dark mixture, and I'll do that in a new spot so that it doesn't pick up too much of our bright pigment. I'll throw in just a hint of titanium white and then I'll put this predominantly around the back and the edges of this very dark area and then I'll kind of blend it out into the side. The side can be a little bit brighter because again it might get a little bit of 
reflected light, but this back area is not going to. So I'm just going to be much more, I'm just going to apply more of this dark pigment. And I'm blending it out, as you can see, with these little strokes that are going in the same direction as the log. That way, if any of them are kind of seen in the end, it just looks like the texture and the movement in the log itself. You can also get kind of a gritty blend by using your finger, going back and forth. Big fan of finger painting. Always have been. Then I'm going to take a bit more of that pigment, work that in down here. Just darken it up. And I think I'll apply this to the entirety of this area right here. There we go. I like that a lot. Doing, doing really well today. So now I'm going to take a little break, clean my brushes again, clean my water, then we'll come back in and we will paint our butterflies. So we are back yet again and we are going to start working on our butterflies. Now for this I'm going to take the smallest square headed brush just because it's the most detail oriented. I'm going to make sure that it's nice and damp and then I'm going to start with the brightest pigments of the butterfly and that'll be in their wings. So I'll take some titanium white and I'll move it over to more of the bright side of the palette. Of course I'll grab just a hint of Mars black but not much at all. And I'm going to start right up here. And I'm going to cover the majority of the butterfly, if not all of it. This pigment, while it has titanium white and titanium white is a thick pigment, it still won't be thick enough with a single layer to cover the entirety of the drawing. So I'll still see the outline of it. And I just want to start by creating a very nice bright base layer. And I want it to look like the wings are one of two things, either semi-transparent, so the light in the background here is shining through them, making them the brightest subject in the painting, or like they are just naturally the most bright subject in the painting. I want the wings to stand out more than anything else, and so I'm going to go about doing that by starting them with this incredibly bright layer. And by doing this bright layer first, I also get to redefine the edges of the wings, as you see. I kind of lost some of those in the background. And we'll start by doing that with this one butterfly, and then we'll move on to the others. So I applied that first layer, then I'm going to grab a hint more Mars Black, just grabbing that with the corner of my brush, mixing that in. And then I'm going to apply this more around the body of the butterfly. I didn't really have enough Mars Black in there to make any difference, so I'm going to grab a little bit more. And then again, I'm going to apply it around the middle, the body, and then I'm going to blend it out around the larger area of the wing. This way it has a little bit of depth, and there is this change of value so that it doesn't look flat just like that. It's very minor, but it does have an effect on the painting. I'm using the corner of my brush for the really detailed areas, and there you can see I have these very stark pigments on there, but I don't want that, so I'm just going to blend them out, and the more we blend them, the more they'll mix with what we currently have on there, and the softer it will get, and that's great. If you accidentally make something too dark, don't worry about it. You can always go back and add the light back in after. And I will be doing that myself. Now I'm going to mix some really dark pigments. So I'll go back over to the darker side of my palette, grab some white, some black, mix up a very, very, very dark pigment, very close to that. And then I'll just paint in the body right there. And then I'll paint in the edges of the wings that are structural. The pieces that kind of keep it all together. And I'm doing this with a very, very subtle, soft application. I don't want much pressure at all in this process. The more pressure I have, the more it will expand. And I want this to look like a very neat little line. 
I'm going to go back to my palette a good number of times through this process because I'm going to want it to be fresh wet paint and I'm going to want a good amount of water in there as well. Now along the corners of these it'll get a little bit more thick and then as it dives in it'll get thinner again and then again as I get to that protruding area it'll get a little bit more thick and then as we come back it'll get smaller. And then I can kind of round out the wing in here like that. And we have, we have a lot of wings, so I'm not going to be meticulous through this. You are more than welcome to. Again, I really don't mind personally if I see some brush strokes in my painting. I do like that look. So I'm going to move a little bit more quickly just because we, we do have a lot of these and this is a lesson, but if you have five or six hours to sit down and work on a painting, by all means, if you'd like it to look meticulous, make it look meticulous. Here I'm using the corner of my brush for a little bit more speed. There we go. And I'll move a couple of little implications inward. So I start from the edge and then I'll just move in. And these are just going to be a nice little extra detail in the wing. That way the butterfly isn't completely plain. And again, don't worry if you kind of do too much or it's a little too dark or too thick. We can always move back in here with some highlight, which I do intend to do. So let's finish it off. Grab some really bright titanium white, mix it with a little bit of that Mars black. I'll apply it at the top where I want it to be the brightest. And there we go. That looks really nice. So that is butterfly number one, with the exception of the adorable little antennas that we'll throw on here. There we go. Wanted that to be the softest, smallest application. Now we'll work on this one here, and I'm kind of working on the ones in the background for the same reason I started my painting in the background. It's a good place to warm up. It isn't directly in our kind of line of sight. It isn't the first thing we notice in the painting. And so we have a lot more room to be kind of loose with it, to try things, to warm up to this very detailed style of painting. So again, I start the wings with just a general application of titanium white. And you can actually do this to multiple of them at the same time. If you just have a good amount of that pigment on there and you want to kind of expand and just get it out there, this is an option. Here we go. Blending it back in. Oh, it's nice. I'll do another one right over here. And generally, again, the light in our subjects is going to change depending upon this, but I do want all of these to look like they are just really popping, incredibly bright, and so I'm not going to really darken or change the values in many of these butterflies. It's going to be fairly simple or consistent, rather. So I started with that nice light base. Now I'll grab a little bit of Mars Black, mix that into our light pigment, and then I'll start close to the body again, and kind of blend that out. Doesn't have to be perfect, but it's relatively soft. Go over here, start close to the body, blend it out. Start here, close to the body, blend it out. Now we can start on the edges, so I'll take some of that Mars Black, mix it up here, take a hint of Titanium White, and we'll make those nice sharp edges and the body. 
I'm holding my brush right now more like a pencil than a, than a paintbrush. And that's just because it's such finite detail. With that said, again, if you find your butterflies are looking a little stiff in application, try holding it back like this. You won't have as much control, but you will get a more fluid painting. And eventually you'll gain that control. It is something that is learned over time and practice. Used to be well practiced at it. I'm not so much at it anymore. It's something I definitely need to work on myself. And it's important to be honest with ourselves and come to those conclusions. There we go. These are turning out quite well. I'm making them all a little bit different, so I'm not following the same exact formula. I am adjusting as I go. Some of them have slightly thicker edges with more bumps. Some of them are more straight. And I'm just kind of changing it up as I see fit. There we go. Now my paint's very watery at this point. It's almost at the point where it will drip. So I'm going to clean my brush very well, and then I'm going to take off all of the water and paint that I have on it, and then I'm going to start again. So it's fairly damp at this point, just because we only dried it off by rubbing it on this cloth, and then we immediately went back to painting. We didn't get all of the water out, but it's significantly less wet than what it was initially. So here, heading back, create some extra fun little lines in this one. There we go. I think I'll also throw a couple of them into this. Not too many. Just enough to make it interesting. There we are. Now, just to show you, we've been doing this in the singular way through this painting, where we do the light first and then we move to the dark. We can work in the opposite way. I can start with the Mars black hint of titanium white, and I can do the edges initially. So here you can just see that, working along a nice edge. And this is just to show you that there are really so many ways to do every technique in painting, and it's really about your preference. So we have a lot of butterflies here. In the very least, I would try doing this with one of them and see if you prefer it. So I'm just starting with kind of outlining it. It's almost like tracing at this point. And I'll move a couple of those lines inwards, as you can see. Then I'll clean my brush, grab a lot of that titanium white, move that up here, mix it in with a little bit of that Mars black, and then I'll paint it this way. Now the issue with this is that the edge there, I wasn't as careful as I should have been, and it's a little bit messy now, which means I'll have to go back over that edge. So it just means that it might involve a little bit more work, but in this case, if you had too much dark, we had to go back in and add the light anyway. So in either case, you could end up doing additional applications. So you might as well do the one that you yourself have more fun with and appreciate. Here we go. I'm going to extend the wings out a little bit more here. Didn't have it initially drawn that way, but you know, we can have some fun. And then we'll brighten some of the ends. There we go. That's fun. Don't be afraid to change your painting as you're working on it. If something feels right, intuitive, it probably is, and you'll probably learn a lot from it.
Now because I extended the highlight in there, I need to extend the darker almost outline. And I'm going to take off a little bit of the wing and just kind of blend it back into the wood here. Now from doing that, I learned that I do not like painting it in that way. So I'm going to go back to the way I was initially painting it with my highlights first. But again, it's good to try and just see what you like yourself. So I'm starting here with that nice bright highlight, grabbing a little bit of that Mars black, putting it at that base area, blending it upwards. And now that we're working on a much larger butterfly, it's much easier to see. And we'll keep that top middle area much brighter. Now we'll move on to the other wing. Start with that bright. Grab a hint of that darker pigment. And you know what, I'll even, I'll put some more back in here. Just kind of move it around until you have what you want. There we go. And again, I'm creating different patterns in some of the different butterflies just to continuously make this painting more interesting. So here, I'll have a little bit of a darker design that moves up around the inside of the wing. And we will also be putting in the darker outskirts as well. So I'll have this extra fun little element in there. There we go. Great. Very, very pleased. So now we can kind of solidify things, take that Mars black, work it along the outside. Again, being delicate. There we go. And believe me, these will look 100 times better once we start adding color. This is just the base layer. That said, I've been doing a lot of these achromatic paintings lately, and I have to say, I really love the look of a black and white painting. I just think that it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It is more of a, a picturesque feel, generally, um, which, which can be interesting. You can get a, a different feeling from it. Maybe a little bit more nostalgic. More of a, a piece of history. So if you are doing this painting and you really love how it turns out in black and white, don't feel like you have to add on the color. We will be, but you don't have to. There we go. Now we're going to move on to this one right here. And I noticed that the bottom of it isn't actually done. I should have had more of the tree here, so I'll just paint that in first, like that. And while I have this dark pigment, I might as well just paint the body of it. Now we'll get back to my preferred process, which is the highlight at the top edge of the wing, blending it down, the highlight, the top edge of the wing. And you'll notice at this point, I'm almost just grabbing paint out of the uh, initial area. However, at this point, there's a lot of grays in there and I'm not getting a pure titanium white at all. So it is okay. I'm not going to get a completely blown out pigment. And a blown out pigment essentially just refers to the same thing that uh, a blown out photograph is. It's an area that has too much light, 
so you can't see any detail in it. It is just entirely overwhelmed. So I'm going to now take a little bit of this dark pigment. I'll work this in the edges around the body, blend it out. I have a little bit extra on my brush, so I'm taking it to the other side just because I, I don't want too, too much over here. So I'm slowly just kind of moving that about There we go. It's quite nice. Now I'll continue down here. And I'm also going to extend this part of the tree over part of this as well, the same way I did that. And I'm just kind of continuously refining the butterfly's shape because we might as well. Now I'll blend these in. There we go. Now we're onto the edges. So more Mars black, hint of titanium white. Work my way around the edge here. Create kind of a fancy little movement. Just make something nice and interesting. And I'll bring that out over there. There we go. Creating some slight designs in here. That's nice. It's kind of different. We haven't done this many little motions in the wings yet before, but I like it a lot. Now I have two butterflies left and I'm actually going to take a little bit of a break, grab some water, and then I'll be right back. I like to take little breaks while I'm painting so that I do again get to remove myself and look at it as a whole, but also because um, it's good to clean our brushes, our water, and to gain that fresh perspective. So I will be right back. So we're back. I took a little bit of a break, but I'm ready to get back into the painting, feeling good, feeling fresh and ready to paint some more butterflies. But as you can notice, a lot of these ones that we have here have dried and they've dried a little bit darker because that's just really what acrylics do. So I'm going to start here by just taking some titanium white, the smallest hint of Mars black, mixing those two together, and then reincorporating some highlights back into the tops of these wings where I want them to be a little bit brighter. And this is really just a, an easy process at this point, just kind of painting in between the areas that we did before. I'm using a fairly loose stroke for a lot of this. I'm not too concerned about the brush strokes showing through. Again, you know that I am actually very much a fan of that look. So these ones are particularly a little bit dark, so I'll fix them up. There we go. It's quite nice already. It's amazing what 45 seconds of touch-ups can do. A lot of us, I think, really love our paintings at the end, but up until that final 85% um, mark of completion, we're not, we're, not in, we're not in love with them. We're not sold by it yet. And it's just so important to stick with it and continue painting until you get to that end point because so much of a painting comes through in that final 10, 15 minutes of detail adding. I mean, if you look at the thumbnail of this video and then you look at what we have right here, we've been painting for a really long time. I don't think we have too, too much more painting to do and it looks honestly completely different. It doesn't have any color yet. And that's a really important lesson to consider 
while you're working on your painting. Don't worry too much about it not looking perfect until you are just about done. And then at that point, you can be like, well, why is this not working? And then kind of just figure it out from there. Of course, you can always uh, send me a, a question. I'm always here and happy to help, but just something to consider. Don't worry about it while you're working on it. Finish it, make it how you want to, and then if you have areas that you're unhappy with at the very end, then, then, then maybe have a, an honest conversation about it. With that said, if you are, uh, again, a member of our Patreon over at the Alpine level, you can always send me uh, your finished paintings over on the Facebook group and we can we can chat about it there and if you are at the mighty oak level i do the one-on-one -on -one personal art reviews so you can send it to me there and i'll make you a little video talking about how to improve so just a couple options for for the community but here you can see i'm back this is my main butterfly so i'm going to spend a bit more time perfecting this one and I started with that white and then I went for the edge. Now I have a little bit of this darker pigment left on my brush, so I will work that into the middle here and blend it up into that brighter white area. And I'm going to do it with a bunch of little strokes, create some extra detail. There we go. Like that a lot. Again, I'll start with some of this bright, almost titanium white. My brush is a little bit dirty, so as I applied pressure, I got that darker mixture down at the bottom, which actually worked really naturally. I like that a lot. I'll just throw a little bit more of that bright pigment on the top, like that, and I'll blend it down into that darker pigment. Now for the edging, Mars Black, Hint, Titanium White, Just like so. Grab some extra titanium white, work in here now. And as you can see, it's not a pure titanium white at all at this point. It is very much a gray. And that just makes it easier for me. There we go. I have some extra on my brush, so I'll just throw it over here. We don't need it right now. If this dries, that's okay. I can always go back over it. Just nice to have that little base layer. So now, get more of that fine pigment. Remember, you can use your finger to rest your hand a little bit, give you slightly more control of the brush, take out any of that shake that might be happening rather than resting your whole palm on the painting. It's just a slightly more delicate way of going about it. And that way you don't accidentally apply pressure on your canvas and kind of create a, a dent of sorts. There we go. Here you can see my hands rotating so that I get the most comfortable sharp application. And then I'll paint the body of the butterfly right here. You can really tell how stark these are in relation to the rest of the painting, and that's perfect because it means they're really going to stand out. Now I'm going to work some of these extra little movements into the painting and I'll even create a nice little design in this one. So here I'm leaving the edge as the bright pigment and then I have this slightly darker gray pigment working its way between the edge and the middle and I'm just having it be a little bit rough and interesting. Give us something different.
There we are. It's looking like a nice original butterfly. Put in a couple little spots on the wing here. Make it even more interesting. Now I'll head down to this last one right here. So, starting with my highlight, at this point you should be saying it. You should know the, the technique fairly well. We've done a good number of these. But again, maybe you're doing it in uh, the opposite way where you start with the darker pigments and you're, um, you're doing it that way. I'm sure that would be fairly confusing at this point. Every time you hear me saying to do something, you, you kind of have to do the opposite of it. But, you know, however you prefer to paint, I, I wholly support that. It's wonderful when painting can be a shared activity as it is through these lessons, but it's also great when it can be our own little special thing. Or maybe even our own little special piece of something that we share in things like this lesson. So here, going back, doing that nice edging. There we go. Really nice. I need to kind of fill in a little bit of this wood that we have here around the butterfly. Again, there are just a couple of areas that went unfinished. That's okay, we have the values to fix it up. It's really easy right now because we are still just working with values. Put in the back of that wing there. Make it widest where we're closest to the butterfly and then maybe have it get a little bit more thin and then get wide again as it gets to the top of the wing. Just an option. Give it a little bit more dimension. There we are. Just doing little touch-ups here and there giving it little extra pieces of detail. Here I'm doing a little splotch effect. I'm going to go back into this one and darken some of the edges. Now it's time for a little touch-ups. And then we can begin the coloring process, which is really just so much fun. It's almost hard to wait. If you wanted, you could keep the edges of this one slightly less dark. Same with this one, because it will make them look farther away. I know I said I wasn't going to deal with that much with these butterflies, but if you wanted to, that would be something you could do. There we are. Now, just going to do the final little touch-ups. Make a really nice dark pigment. Create a couple really dark markings in there. Have a couple of little lines. Again, this will be included in the digital sketch, so you don't have to guess where I'm putting them. There we are. Blend that in. Very interesting. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to let all of this dry entirely. It needs to be 100% dry before we move on to the next step, which is glazing. And I'll give you a, a brief overview of that once we uh, let this dry. So I will see you in just a second. I'm going to clean my brushes, my water very well. I'm also going to clean my palette so that I have room for lots of fun colors. And then we'll be right back with a brand new technique and a really, really fun time. So yet again, we are back. I have clean brushes, I have clean water, I have a clean palette with a bunch of additional colors. 
And now it's time for a little introduction on glazing. I know I've done a couple of videos on this in the past, but I think it's important that we get our refreshers and that way things stay sharp. So glazing is essentially when you apply a very thin layer of paint atop an already finished layer of paint and you don't disrupt the line work shapes or values. So it's essentially taking this yellow or this blue, applying it on top, but not changing any of the pre-existing paint. You're essentially just adding color to what you already have. And it's a really great way of just kind of using color as an afterthought. So we were able to establish all of our depth and values through the black and white, and now we get to add the color on very simply and not worry about all of that. So it just breaks the painting down. We're going to use a little dish of water here for glazing. When you apply a lot of water to a minuscule amount of paint, you get a very watery, paint substance and that works great for a glaze. You can go out and you can buy mediums for it and lots of different uh, options are there. But I like to use water because I feel like water is a very versatile medium and the more that I use it, the better that I get at using it in all other situations and contexts. So it's just a, a great accessible medium. So let's do this. I'm going to take my larger square headed brush. Again, it is two centimeters. I'm going to make sure that the brush is nice and damp, and then I'm going to take a little bit of the color that I want for the background, which in this case is an ultramarine blue. And actually, let's talk about the colors quickly here first. I have a titanium white right here. I have a light blue permanent right here. I have an ultramarine blue. Here is a primary yellow. This is a cadmium yellow deep hue. This is a burnt umber. This is a burnt sienna and here we have a Mars black. You're more than welcome to use just a regular primary yellow, a regular primary blue, and then a brown or two. This is just going to give me a little bit more option. With that said, here I'm going to take this ultramarine blue. Ultramarine blue leans a little bit more towards red, so you can mix a little bit of primary red with your blue to get it closer to this. It's slightly more purpley. I'm going to take a bit of extra water, move it out here, and the goal is to make this paint almost like watercolor. So you can see as I move it around, it doesn't really react like paint. It reacts more like colored water. And then I'm going to take this and I'm going to apply it on top of my background very, very simply like this. And I'm just going to put it on top of all of my trees, on top of the light, and it's just going to give the background this nice blue look. Now, I'm going to get some more of that. Again, make sure that it's very watery to begin with. And then just kind of throw that on there. And I'm going to avoid the butterflies for the most part in the beginning, but as you can see right here, this is beginning to drip, and it's going to begin to drip on that butterfly. I'm not worried about that at all. When you paint with a glaze, you kind of surrender a little bit of control to the paint and to the medium. And you get these really different interesting markings that you probably wouldn't have tried to achieve, but you probably wouldn't have been able to achieve if you tried to achieve them either. So it's a way of making the painting look a little bit more like a painting um, and let it just be this beautifully, naturally occurring thing. So here I'm kind of jumping around the painting and you'll notice that this first layer that I'm applying, while it's blue, it's not hyper vibrant or saturated. It's just this very subtle first application and that's great because it lets you build it up over time naturally. Now I'm going to throw a little bit of light blue permanent in there. It's going to thicken the pigment. Light blue permanent is a slightly thicker pigment. You could also thicken it with a little bit of titanium white, but I'm just trying to get something that's slightly more thick than what we have. And then I'll go back and I'll apply that over our trees. And this layer, as you can see, is already more saturated. It's more blue. And that's happening because we added a slightly thicker pigment, but it's also happening because this is our second layer now. And the more layers that we add, the more saturated it's going to get. But as you can see, the values of the trees are all remaining the same. We still have the darker ones, the lighter ones, and 
the consistency of it remains, which is the most important thing. So here you can see I'm going back, I'm mixing more. I'll throw that into the background as so. Get a little bit more of that dark blue for over here. And then just blend it out. Because it's so watery, you can kind of jump around a lot and then go back to areas. Because it remains wet for such a long period of time because of the added water. Now I'm getting a little bit of it over my foreground. That's okay, I'm not too concerned. Again, we will layer its own color over it, and we'll just continue layering this color over what we're currently doing. Now once the painting, or the area of the painting that you're working on is very wet, you can almost just grab paint off the palette and apply it, and it's not going to hinder the initial sketch that you have on there, or the initial base layer that you have on there. So here you can see I'm just going over everything and bringing this blue back over, put more of that blue on this side, and at the bottom too a little bit. Maybe at the top. If you add it too much in an area, you can use your finger to just kind of scrape it off. It's very malleable. There we go. It's turning out really nice. I like this a lot so far. Making it more and more saturated, especially along the edges. Because I want this area to be a bit brighter as if the light is really shining through it. You can see that my brush strokes are really happening in a lot of directions and that's just to give it a little bit more of a brush strokey look. We could be very, very pristine with it. We could just move all in horizontal strokes or all in vertical strokes and get something that's very consistent, but that's not really what I want out of this. I do want the middle to be a bit more blue, so I'll move that in. And it's nice that it lets you build it up in such delicate, small layers. So many layers. Because you get so much time to just kind of live with it and say, do I want this? Do I want to change this? How do I change this if I want to? You know, I kind of ask all of those questions. Here I'm grabbing a bit of that light blue permanent, tiny bit of that titanium white. And I'll just work a little bit of that into the middle here. Again, I am starting to go over my butterflies a little bit, but I'm okay with that. Here I'm cleaning up a little bit of it by doing these vertical strokes from the bottom to the top. Very light, very minimal amount of pressure. Take a little bit more blue, throw that over here. There we go. Now I'm going to stand up, take a couple of steps back, and evaluate as we do. Now, I really like how it's looking. However, I do want it to be a little bit darker, I think. So I'm going to take a hint of this Mars black, and I do mean just a hint. I'm going to work that into the blue that we have over here, and we can make a bit of a darker blue glaze. Speaking of darker, uh, a cloud seems to be rolling by. I should definitely check the viewfinder. And actually that looks quite good. It looks more like how I want the painting to look. So I'll actually just take some of this darker wet blue, begin by throwing that on the sides here, mix up a bit more. And that's exactly what I mean about painting an in inconsistent light. It can be frustrating at times, but it can also show you the painting in a way you actually want it to be and, and teach you something about it. So it's important to keep an open mind. I know I got a little bit frustrated with it a couple weeks back, um, but there, there are actually so many positives. And, you know, it's, it's just important to focus on those positives. So here, continuing 
all of those nice blue darker strokes. I'm also trying to make it a little bit darker so that my butterflies can stand out and be the brighter subject in the painting. Because they're too going to be blue. And oh my, that is a big cloud. Okay, I, I think I'm going to take a little bit of a break, let this system of clouds pass, and then I'll be right back. But I really like how the background's looking. Okay, that little system of clouds has passed and we can get back to the painting. So now, I'm quite happy with the background. We might add a little bit of color to it later, but for now I'm very, very pleased with it. I'm going to move on to the moss here in the foreground. And moss is typically green, but as you can see I don't have any actual green on my palette. I'm going to mix it by taking some of our blue. You can use primary blue, I'm using the ultramarine blue. And then I'm going to grab a little bit of this primary yellow. I'm going to mix those two together and voila! A really nice lush green. I'm going to make sure that it's nice and damp. And then I'll start applying this onto the painting. And different colors glaze differently. Some of them I find look better, work better than others. And greens are some of those pigments that just work extremely, extremely well. Always incredibly beautiful. So here I'm loosely working to the edge of this branch. And I am trying to avoid the butterflies with this pigment just because it doesn't make sense with them. But I'm now going to change my glazing color by working with this slightly warmer, darker yellow. And I'll grab a little bit of that blue. And you can see that I have a, a very different green happening. It's much more olivey, it's much warmer. And I'll apply this kind of in the darker areas. And then splotch it throughout as well. So this is another really big benefit of glazing. You get this opportunity to just be so much more fluid with the colors you're adding and the way you mix them. It's just all very natural. I like it a lot. There we go. Now I'm going to want a little bit of a brown for the bark. I want it to be more of a brownish gray, so I'll take some of my burnt umber, take a little bit of my burnt sienna, Burnt sienna is more of a reddish brown. And then I'll take some titanium white and some Mars black and I'm grabbing those two to give it that gray. There we are. And now we'll throw this on top of our wood, as so. As you can tell, it's very watery right now. It's a little bit drippy. And this is our first application, so it's not as saturated as everything else, but it's also not as saturated because we mixed in that gray. And here you can see I'm just doing a very loose overlay, some of the green, kind of bringing some of those greens up into the brown. And you know what, I can even grab some of those greens and throw them up here anyway, just have a little bit of moss interspersed throughout it. And for that I think I want to go with the more deep yellow, more olivey moss. There we are. Doing a little bit of a tap to get a textured effect. As we do this, you can see that I also have a little bit of blue showing through. That's because it didn't mix perfectly in the green. But it's nice that now we have some blue happening down in here as well because it just diversifies it even more. Here I'm just grabbing some pure blue. I'm just mixing that in the green at this point, making it more interesting. I'll use a bit of that blue and that brown down here in the rock as well. It'll get some blue reflected light on it, but the rock itself will be more of that warm brown color. If I add too much water, I just wipe off the excess of my brush and then I'll move back in 
and I just kind of reapply. But again, my, my strokes fairly loose through most of this. I'm not trying to do anything too particular. I'm letting the painting evolve more as it wants to evolve. Which is again a, a very freeing process. I talked about why I loved acrylic painting initially in that I really loved how you could just paint over things and you had this level of control and if it didn't want to work with you, well, you could change it. But there's also this really brilliant side that once you have everything where you want it and you want to start glazing, you can do that and you can just add things as we are here. So here I'm taking a little bit of that extra burnt sienna and I'm throwing it into some of the rock here and as well the bark and it's just this added nice warm tone and otherwise cool painting. Add a little bit of blue down inside here. So I have a warm outline on the edge from the really nice color of the bark and then as I get into the darker area where you can't see the bark at all you get that cool more atmospheric color. I'm going to take a bit of burnt umber just splash that in as well. Can have little bits of it show through down in the mossy area as well. As well, as well, as well. As well seems to be the term of the, the video. Sometimes when you talk for too long, things just stick and you kind of choose words or patterns and lean on them. That seems to be the one of the day. This was intended to be an hour long lesson. I think we're closer to two and a half at this point, but that's okay. You know what? I think we're learning a lot. We're having a lot of fun and we're all going to end up with a painting we really care about. And again, I, I don't, I don't know that any lesson in this hour long series is actually going to be an hour ever again. We're working on these larger canvases. We're doing these more detailed paintings. We're learning these extra techniques and you know what, I think that's okay. I think it's actually a really good thing. So I'm going to now take a couple of steps back, look at the painting, give it again another proper honest view. And my review is that I love glazing. I think this looks wonderful so far. I'm going to sit back down. I'm going to make the edge of this a little bit green. And I'm going to do that with this yellow. I'm just going to glaze a little bit here at the bottom. Move it up. See how I like it. I just want to connect the background and the foreground through color a little bit. And I think because these trees are fairly close, having a little bit of green in them isn't a bad idea. Just move that forward a little bit, scrape off a little bit. Move back in a little bit of blue. Find that nice balance. Here I'm doing some vertical strokes just in case it doesn't entirely blend. It looks like the silhouette of a tree. Take a little bit of that work it over here too. I also want a little bit more blue on this corner just to tie it all together. So I'll throw that there. Now yet again, I'm going to take a couple of steps back, give it another honest evaluation. I think that's even better. It really, it connects it and it brings the eye Truly really enjoy this brighter area as well. So that worked well. That worked really, really well. 
Now I'm going to start working on the butterflies themselves. So for this, I'm going to switch to the medium-sized square-headed brush. Again, this one is about a centimeter wide. I'm going to use this because it's a little bit more detail-oriented. Now I want these butterflies to really stand out. So I'm going to use this light blue permanent. I'm going to grab a little bit of water, thin it. But this is going to be, as you can see, the most vibrant and saturated pigment in the entire painting. By far, without a doubt. There we go. It's a fairly thick pigment, so when you cover up a pigment like black, it does tend to soften it a little bit. And that really isn't an issue. We can always go back and redo it. But it's important to note that some pigments are more transparent than others and some pigments are more opaque than others. So they'll have different levels of transparency. And when you're glazing, it will have an effect. Never to the point where it's a bad thing though. I want to brighten the middle of this wing, so I'll grab some titanium white, work that in, work it in the back. There we go. Really nice. Take some of that highlight and I'll work it into the top of this one as well. Essentially doing the same thing we did when we painted the wings the first time, except this time we're doing it with a little bit of color. And we know exactly how we're doing it and where we're doing it because we already did it. There we are. Using the corner of my brush for that really detailed work. Trying to avoid the edges for the most part, though I can always go back and fix them up. Just kind of using the excess paint that I have on my brush right now. There we go. And again, I'm using light blue permanent. You don't need to use or find light blue permanent. You could use primary blue mixed with some titanium white and it should give you something very similar. I guess I haven't mentioned it yet, but the majority of these are Liquitex Basics. This is Windsor and Newton, as well as this one. I really love Windsor and Newton with oil painting. And I, I saw the pigments and I figured we'd give them a try because I didn't see them in the Liquitex Basics and I, I really enjoy how they worked out. So, I do like the two brands, and I do like them together. There we go. Continue with some additional butterflies over here. And we'll go back in and we will add additional shades and colors to these wings. I'm just... Continuing with this, because I have the blue on my brush and in my water, and if I start working with other colors, I can dilute it, I can make the brush dirty. So I'm working with a very pure pigment right now, and I'm just going to continue working with it until I'm almost done with it. That way, I don't have too much uh, diluted paint going around. There we go. Really love the designs in this one. Going to try to preserve them as best as I can. As you can see though, the light blue permanent, it really covers up things significantly more than any other pigment we used. The green that we have really left all the detail. The browns that we had left all the detail. The Ultramarine blue left all the detail in the background, but this it is stripping it a little bit And that's important to note If you want a very transparent white to use for glazing to mix with your pigments to make them brighter Zinc white is a great white for that titanium white. It's a, a fairly thick pigment It's very opaque 
So it's great for doing base layers and, and doing a lot of um, thick applications at the end, but if you want something very thin, a zinc white is ideal. So now I'm going to switch over to the ultramarine blue, and I'm going to throw this closer to their bodies, and then work it out. There we are. It's already really beautiful. I like that. I like that a lot. I had a suspicion it would work well. I did not know it would work as well as it is. It's a lot of paint right there. Definitely need to be a little bit more delicate with it. And in fact, I'm going to switch over to the smaller square headed brush so I can be just that. Give me a little bit more control to work in these smaller, more detailed areas. Going to work that ultramarine blue into the designs of this one. Just accentuate them a little bit with it. But of course, blend it out from the body. There we go. It's innately a darker value than the light blue permanent, so it's also creating a little bit of depth in here for us as well. So that's nice. That's why it's easier to paint with black and white and establish depth because pigments innately do have different values from each other and we all have preconceived notions about which ones are brighter or darker and we can be wrong. So it's just easier to separate the two processes and we can get them much more exact. And also I love the process of glazing and it gives us the ability to do a lot of it here at the end. You can also go in once we're done with the glazing with very thick layers. So I'll take a lot of this light blue permanent, take some titanium white with this very thick pigment and I'll just throw this on top of the paint that I already have here. So it's not really going to blend much and it's not going to act as a glaze, it's going to be the definitive final layering. And we have a much better idea of where we want to place it because, of course, we did all of the base layers and we did the glazing layer. There we go. Now it's getting to be a little bit difficult to work with because of all of the water. The more water you add, the more um, stubborn the paint can get. But again, that can be a nice thing because it, it kind of creates itself. But I do want a little bit more control for the finishing touches. So I'm going to let this dry for the most part, take about five, six minutes of a break, and then I'll be right back to do some of our finishing touches. I accidentally just took a little bit of green from down there and put it in that wing. I like it a lot. That was a nice little accident. In fact, I think I'll take a little bit more of this green and I'll put it in this one. There we go. So, anyways, break and then we'll, we'll get right back to it. So, after kind of resting with the painting, letting the things dry for a bit, I've come back to the painting and I've added a couple of different colors to my palette. Here I have a medium magenta. You can mix this out of titanium white and primary red. And then here I have a brilliant purple, which you can make out of primary red, primary blue, and titanium white. But I'm going to actually try to diversify the color of the painting a little bit by changing a couple of the butterfly's colors. So I'm going to take some of this medium magenta, and I'm actually going to just start applying it on top of the blue that I have in this butterfly right here. And I'm doing this just because I feel like this pink and blue go really, really well together. And we have such a blue and green painting, I wanted to make it a little bit more diverse. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm just trying 
to throw a little bit of another color in there and see if I like it. If I don't, that's okay. I can always go back and repaint in the blue that we initially had for a couple of these butterflies, but I want to give it a fair shot. And I feel like I've talked about how great acrylic paint is so many times in this lesson because you get to continuously just try things and if you don't like it, that's fine. Wait five minutes, paint over it. And I feel like I, I keep talking about it, I should, I should probably do it myself. So here I'm going to take some of that purple, I'm going to throw that at the bottom of these wings right here. So the pink at the top, the purple at the bottom, blending them kind of in between. A little bit of the blue is showing through, but I'm okay with that. I think it's kind of a neat effect. I'm not using a lot of water in this because I'm looking for a fairly opaque application. Here I'll use this one and I'm going to do three of them. Generally when you are throwing a new color into a painting you don't want to put it in one area because then it'll draw the eye to that area, it'll be too stark. And you don't want to put it in two spots of the painting because you run the risk of kind of splitting your painting in half. So you want to work in odd numbers, three, five, seven. And so I'm also going to do this one over here. I chose the three I did because I have a large one and two small ones. We have a couple large ones. I wanted to make sure that it was represented. And then I chose this one because I needed something on this side and it was either this one or this one. And I didn't want it to be this one because I already have a large one. And then I needed a small one over here to balance it out uh, because this is so close to the edge. So that's kind of how I went about my decision making process for that. But here you can see I'm just doing some thick layers, very simply. I'll create a bit of a highlighted pink by taking my titanium white and my medium magenta. I'll blend those two together until we have something much more bright. It'll make it less vibrant every time you add white to something, you take away the saturation in it. But as you can see, it really pops because it's just such a brighter value than what we had. And I'm applying this to the tops and then I'll blend it back down. Same technique as before. There we go. Now, this close up, I'm really not sure honestly how I feel about this. And I think I need to take a couple of steps back to get a much more honest look at it. So I'm going to do that once I finish kind of these edges because I want to give it a, a fair chance and make sure that I'm not making too hasty of a decision because I didn't really put my heart into it. Need to commit to really see how you feel. There we go. Just like that. Now I'm going to take those steps back, give it a good honest look. I feel like blue and pink work really well together and, and I like them here too. It's kind of different with the organic green color. Generally, you don't see them uh, with that mixture, but it's fairly interesting. I've decided that I'm going to keep them for now and continue adding some detail to my painting. So we talked about the moonlight kind of coming in this way and I want to express that through light. I want to add an extra layer of depth and light into this painting and I'm going to do that with this smaller square headed brush. I'm going to take some of our titanium white, move it off to the edge of our painting here and we're going to paint some moonlight coming through the trees. And I'm going to make sure that it's nice and wet, almost like a glaze, that way it's semi-transparent. 
And then I'm going to pick some ways in which it's going to come down. And I know I'm going to want a small one over here because it's so dark, I don't want a lot, otherwise it'll be too much of a contrast for the background. So I'm going to decide on an angle in which I want these painted. Again, if you have the digital sketch, you will have the exact angle. Just kind of trying to figure it out. I think I want to start from the bottom here and I'll work it through the butterfly right behind it. So I'm starting with this very stark pigment as you can see. Making it through a lot of little strokes here. And then I'm going to go back to my water while it's still wet. The, the paint, not the water. And then I'm going to add some extra water to those strokes. I'm just going to go up and down, back and forth, and soften all of it with that water. I'm applying very minimal pressure and I'm trying to blend it out on both sides to give me something that's fairly transparent. We don't want to go over a butterfly with this, but there we have a little bit of moonlight kind of cascading in. Add a little bit of extra light to the top. And you could do this with yellow or a different color, but I already feel like we've added the pink in there, and I want to be a little more conservative with my coloring for just a little bit. Now I'll do another one right here. Have it work right around slash behind this butterfly. And then I'll do another one right here, kind of have the light hitting this one. Or at least you can see the light showing through its wings. I'm going to kind of change the direction of this one a little bit. Softening the edges, lots of little wet strokes. This is ideally something you would do before the butterflies, but I didn't really think about it until just now, and I thought, you know what? That's, that's too neat of an idea to not try in this one. Here you can see that I'm starting to push paint to a singular side. It's giving me more of this beam effect, which is quite neat. Continue with a couple smaller openings that aren't going to get as far. There we go. Kind of making it this really beautiful surreal piece at this point. I want to soften this one so I'll just add a lot of water. Just kind of move that up and down. Add more light around the top and then have it dissipate as we get farther down. As you can see, I'm consistently just changing the angle a little bit and I'm able to do that because it's still so wet. Just trying to get it exactly how I want it. Here, you know what, I'll mix up a really nice bright blue while we're at this, just to see how bright I can get these wings, how interesting we can get them. See how bright I can make that light, because I can only make it as bright 
as I can make these wings bright because I need to make these wings the standout piece of this painting and I can't make the light any more vibrant or bright than them. So these are my top priority and then I can make the light bright in relation to them. Going to grab a little bit more of our ultramarine blue, work that in the base close to the body of some of these, give them a bit more saturation and color. Doesn't that make that stand out so much more? Getting a little bit more quiet through this process because it's much more of touching things up and assessing them on an individual basis rather than doing a, a larger concept. So it just requires a little bit more thought, a little bit more um, time to focus. Then I'll put a couple little dust particles, different things, spores, in the air here and I'll do that through a little tap with a titanium white and then I'll blend it in with my finger and it'll give it this nice little soft bokeh effect over different portions of this painting. Do a couple of them showing in the light because that's really where they'll be a be apparent and that's how you see them much more prominently when they are in the light. See, good number of them down here because the light's kind of hitting this foggy patch and illuminating it. Didn't really intend to do a lot of fog in this or really any, it just kind of happened with the glazes. And that's really nice. Some of these can also be implied little butterflies in the background. You can paint them with two little strokes, turn them into wings, give it a lot more depth. There we go. That's a lot of little butterflies, kind of flying up in this nice little C shape. It's kind of interesting. Lots of ways to just add to these paintings, especially now that we're working on the larger canvases. There, just um, randomly added a, a full, fully sized butterfly. There's another one. We'll throw one over here. Lots of these beautiful little blue ones. And then I'll also add some of the spores with light in the foreground, some of those little dust particles. There we go. Didn't intend for most of these little touch-ups in the initial drawing but they just kind of happened and again it's about going with your intuition and and giving these things a try. Little blue atmospheric particles with light coming through them, it's nice because we didn't have a lot of blue in that area or a lot of light. To be able to throw that in is a great thing. making it look like a real butterfly forest here. Throw a little bit more light in this stream now that I know 
how bright my butterflies are. Not a pure titanium white right now. I do have a fair bit of blue in this and that's okay because we will have that atmospheric light working through it. I'll make this area a little bit brighter now. Just kind of play on that idea of fog in the light. I'm blending it all out with my finger because it's just going to give me a slightly softer look. Do a little bit of it back here as well. Just kind of work it in and around some trees. Dipping in front of and behind. Making sure my wood here still has a nice sharp edge. And now we've done a lot of little details, I'm going to step back again and reassess what I'm doing. So after committing to all of these blue butterflies in the background, I think I would just prefer to have it be a blue, green, and a little bit of brown in the painting. So while we painted these with purple, I'm now going to quickly cover them back up with blue. So again, I wasn't, I wasn't sure about it um, to begin with, and then when I did it, I, I again wasn't sure, and you know, that's okay. Not every change we make to the painting is going to be something we love, and we can go back and we can fix things and, and change things, and that's exactly what I intend to do. Will it take an extra three and a half minutes? Yes, maybe, perhaps it will. But now I know definitively that I didn't actually want it to be pink, and you know what, that's okay. I think pink and blue are really, really nice colors together. I really love them in urban settings. However, I don't think when you interject a green and these more organic and earthy tones, it works well. Because the blue and the pink, I think, are more um, innately tied to this idea of neon and uh, modernization and the future and it just didn't blend in the way that I wanted it to. Now little bits of this purple and pink are showing through the blue right now and it's actually a really nice effect. So that's something I will leave to show through. I won't cover all of the pink entirely. I won't use these multiple incredibly thick opaque layers. I will let some of that show through because I think in the minor amount that it's left, it will be nice. I don't think it's necessary at all, but I do think that it's a, a nice little touch for anyone who sees the painting in person. So here I'm just going back, making the edges of the wings a little bit brighter, like that. Yeah, I already like the painting a lot better again. But I'm glad we tried. The more layers we do on these butterflies, by the way, the, the more interesting they will get. It's the, the same thing for really most anything. You just, if you keep going, you keep adding detail, your painting, your subject will get better and better. Your understanding of it will increase and you'll just end up with a more interesting painting. So while I know I did a lot of 10 minute paintings for a long time, just to kind of teach people the basics of acrylic painting, and with those, there was a lot of one layer systems for time's sake and for teaching's sake and keeping it simple. But if you want a more intricate painting, lots of depth in color and different interesting things happening, taking the time to do three or four layers can really be a, a wonderful thing. Here I'm just throwing some extra little designs and patterns up into the wings of this one. Throw those back here as well. I'm 
really, really liking this. Again, I, I talked about a while ago how the painting kind of comes together in that final 10% and that's exactly what's happening. I'm going to take some Mars Black hint of our blue, mix those two together, and I'm going to redo some of the edges for these prominent butterflies. It's fairly stark, but I like it. Really pops. Make sure that these are really nice thin lines if you're going back and doing this. With the exception of maybe the corners of the edges here. There we are. Little details are really coming out now and making it special. The white from the blue just blended with the more black that I wanted to use there, but that's actually okay. It left more of a muted gray and I'm going to leave that in that area right here just because I think that it's nice that it makes this corner a little bit softer. So it's vignetted, so it's darker, so it doesn't draw the eye, but it's also now less stark, so it will additionally not draw the eye. So we're really, we're pushing the viewer's, uh, the viewer's eye up here more so, which is really the intent. And I'm just going to continue trying to do that by making this a little bit more stark. There we go. and making this butterfly our real centerpiece. So I'm going to give it these kind of extravagant wings up here at the top. Beautiful little points to them. Making it pop. I'm going to leave this one with more of the softer edges because it's more in the light and I want it to be a little bit more of a subdued butterfly as it's, it's a little bit um, more an atmospheric light like the background. This one's more of a centerpiece, so I'm going back and I'm touching up its wings. And I'll also do a little touch up on this one, but I'm not going to do much because it's over to the right hand side and I don't want to put too much attention over here. The same goes for this bottom area. They're a little bit more muted, but that's okay. That's kind of how I prefer them. Here I'm just working a little bit of extra detail into these wings. Just a little bit. And you know what, I don't love all of that, so I will mute a little bit of it. Take a little bit more blue, put it back on top. Easy fix. There we go. Wonderful. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm complimenting my own painting. I just I just realized what that might be perceived as. It's more just of the technique, it's, it's working the way it's meant to and it's creating something that was either intentionally what we wanted, a very nice thing, but 
Um, as you can tell, as we get to the three hour stage of this painting, my ability to communicate is getting lesser and lesser. It's just getting a little bit more difficult. But here, I'm throwing some additional highlights into the tops of these light beams, fixing them up a little bit, making it a little bit stronger. Because we made the wings more strong, so we were able to do that in comparison. Now I'm going to take a little bit of my burnt umber, burnt sienna, and just kind of fix the top of this. I'll need a little bit of gray mixed in there just because it isn't a hypersaturated pigment that we have up here at the top. Just going to try to define it a little bit more. It's working really nicely. Okay. Just do a couple more little touch-ups, I guess. Little butterflies in the background. There we go. Added too much water there, that's okay. And just kind of take that off really easy. I'm gonna take a couple of steps back and see what I think. After taking a couple of steps back, I realized that this, this is the painting I wanted to make. I didn't realize that it was the painting I wanted to make. Uh, we did just kind of happily land on the light rays and the butterflies in the background and all of that, but I'm so happy we did. I had a wonderful time working on this. I hope that you feel like you learned a lot about the achromatic palette, about glazing, about working with water and creating more transparent layers and kind of blending it all with different techniques on the wood. I feel like we did a lot here today. I'm really proud of this one and I hope you enjoyed. If you are new to the channel, I do post every Saturday. I will see you next Saturday, so make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell button. And if you are a member on Patreon at the Alpine level, please share your painting with me over on the Facebook group. I can't wait to see and talk about these. I think they'll be really, really neat. Also, you're more than welcome to play with some different colors of butterflies and create some inventive things with that as well. Um, the traceable and digital sketch are up over on Patreon. But I, I would just like to end this with a big thank you for, you know, watching this year with me today, supporting the channel, liking, leaving comments, doing all of the things that we do to make this a, a vibrant community. But I will see you next Saturday with a new painting. I am very excited to get back to the painting. I know we just finished this one, but it just created such, a, such an excitement and uh, I'm really looking forward to continuing to paint with you. So. Thank you, I will see you very soon, and above all, as always, stay creative.